Okay, today we're giving a little overview of compost, construction of an aerobic windrow pile, and we, we have made a part of a pile and we're going to continue on. So let me just say a few overarching things. Uh, mostly what we're doing is we're trying to create a habitat, a pasture, as you, uh, if you will, for microbial life to flourish. The process of decomposition of a whole array of different organic materials, anything that was once alive, plants, animal manures, etc., is accomplished as a part of a biochemical physical process. Let's break that down. The biochemical aspect of it. The decomposition happens via microbial decomposition. Microbes, bacteria, fungi, things called actinomyces, protozoa, and more. Um, and they decompose with enzymes and acids, so it's biochemical decomposition, but also physical. One is in making the pile and chopping material up, and if you should turn it once, twice, thrice, you are physically altering that stuff, and it breaks it up, and it encourages it to be broken down further by the microbes. Um, so I'm gonna just uh, peel uh, back the tarp here, and hopefully they still remain. Uh, can you see scurrying little herd of, as kids call them, roly polies or sow bugs? Uh, and uh, what's up with that? Uh, so, first, you have different waves. Initially, in a compost pile, you'll have a huge surge of bacterial populations, and they will break down the really green, succulent, nitrogenous material. And then you have fungi coming in, and they're better at the more carbonaceous material. And then you have actinomycetes, which is quite a, a mouthful, and they just flat out eat, enzymatically eat, wood, carbon, cellulose, lignans, like that. And you'll get to a point in a pile where it's not fully broken down, uh, but it's still altered from transformed from what it was in terms of the plant leaves, the manure, the straw and leaves and all that jazz. Uh, and that's when macroorganisms come in earthworms certainly, uh, centipedes, millipedes, sow bugs, earwigs, and more. They eat semi-decomposed organic matter. Some of the stuff we put on is already at that stage. And in fact, uh, yesterday we purposely capped off our layers with some older compost that quite frankly was okay but not great. So you could call it, well one, it's a microbial inoculant, but it had a resident herd, as it were, of obviously sow bugs. So as I often do, I'm gonna pose the question to you, what do you make compost out of? Organic material. Organic material, anything that was once alive, principally plants and animal manures. Um, but a more general answer would be, what can you get, what is available in your area for free or low cost. Free stuff is good. Um, we live in a Mediterranean climate. We don't have a lot of deciduous trees, but there are some. Right across the driveway we have some, so we harvest them. If you live in an area that is rich with uh, more temperate climates with, with uh, deciduous trees, you've got a gold mine. <laughs> there are leaves that people want to get rid of. In fact, if I lived in such an area, I might stop gardening and go into the making compost out of leaves business to sell to gardeners and farmers like that. So uh, leaves, deciduous broad leaves uh, uh, like that, uh, good. Uh, we buy in straw, so here are some leaves from a deciduous tree. The tree crew on campus chips trees so we get wood chips. I'm overviewing the carbon-based products first. We'll come back and talk about how they function in a pile. Deciduous tree leaves, wood chips of any manner. Uh, clean straw, but I actually like funky halfway broken down straw because 
it's already on the way to decomposing. It's easier to wet and fit in. A lot of times if you put a lot of straw in a pile, it's very difficult to wet and you have a dry layer uh, like that. So, uh, but uh, I stress the word straw and not hay. Straw is the stock below the head of the grain, oats, barley, rye, whatever. Uh, and you don't want to use hay. One, if you're buying it, it's three times more expensive. Two is you're seeding your compost pile with grasses, which can cause all kinds of problems when applied to the garden. So straw. Uh, and again, if you lived in an area where there's a lot of haying, uh, farms will always have, or if there's horse operations or any animal operation, they will always have a lot of Boiled straw, sat out all winter, and that's the stuff they want you to take it away, and that's the stuff you might want to go and get like that. So, carbon based materials, uh, or browns as we call them, deciduous leaves, wood chips, straw. Now we're moving to the other end of the spectrum nitrogen based materials, any type of animal manure, but keep in mind that with uh, with most animals, half of the nitrogen is in the feces and half is in the urine. So if you get manure from an operation that has bedding material in the stalls, it will soak up and absorb the urine and increase the nitrogen content. Um, so this is a horse manure from local stables with an admixture of wood chips, sawdust, and straw. Extremely nitrogenous. Moving down the line, all manner of succulent green material, whether they're weeds that have not gone to seed or you can grow a cover crop expressly for this purpose, you skim it off and bring it up to make compost. And then we have some sketchy stuff here. Uh, this is that which used to be green and it's still a little green but it's not fully brown. It's just something we need to process and recycle in the pile. So we're going to put a little bit of this in sequentially through the pile. And then we have the home gardener's dilemma. Gooey goppy kitchen straps. You want to just put them on a pile like that. <laughs> well, in a little more detailed manner. But th this is an issue. This is an issue for people in small households with small gardens. Got a whole lot of kitchen scraps. Got a whole lot of nothing else. My suggestion is, as a home composter, you go and get representative examples of these, particularly carbon, but also nitrogen-based material, so you can mix it up. A compost pile is better in the decomposition and better in the end product if it's made of an admixture of different components like that. Uh, so uh, our goal today, we have about a half a dozen buckets of these of this kitchen scrap is to take this gooey go goppy stuff and incorporate it into the pile. Whenever I'm using such a substance, I will have the layer below it be very dry and carbonaceous and the layer above it similarly. Uh, so it's kind of blending the wet and the nitrogenous with the dry and the larger particle carbon like that. Okay, so that's what we have available to us at the present time here. And uh, let's talk a little bit about ratios. Uh, to cut to the quick, we are going to put on about three times as much nitrogenous or green material as carbonaceous material. And that is a good volumetric ratio to get the conditions we need to foster microbial life in the pile. It's, if you were to look at it on a cellular level, it would analyze out to be about a 30 to 1 ratio, 30 parts carbon to 1 part nitrogen. Uh, and that's uh, something you could do, but it's somewhat abstruse and complex. We just combine comparative volumes, 3 parts green nitrogenous, 1 part carbon browns. Uh, and the reason for this ratio between carbon and nitrogen is that's the ratio at which the microbes use that material. They use the carbon to build their cell structure. Again, in the 
instance of bacteria, a single cell organism. Uh, and they use the carbohydrates that they can glean from the carbon-based products to fuel their metabolism, to get energy, to do their work just as we do. You're going to go run and you have a granola bar, boom, like that. Uh, so that's the carbon base. And the nitrogen material is used uh, basically for their procreation, to make more of themselves, and for all their metabolic needs. Uh, so this ratio is an important one. Uh, and uh, so that's a simple way of doing it is three parts green material, one part uh, uh, brown material. So we uh, have been making this pile and I have to say this is one of the more exquisitely form piles I've ever seen in 45 years. I tell you that, but maybe I shouldn't because you get a swelled head and you slack off. But I say keep up the good work. So that attention to detail here and everywhere else in the garden is, is pretty important. Uh, and again, we'd like to build this pile maybe up to this height or this height. Uh, and as we go up, it is critically important that the top is flat so it can accept and keep the material and that your volume is, you're basically making a cube. You, you do not want a pyramid. So one of the operating principles that can ensure success is a thing called, it's about the pile size, about its dimensions, and it's called volume to surface area. You want a maximum internal volume and a minimum surface area. Again, if I divided this pile into sixes or eights and made six or eight little piles, it would be also cute and boutique and it would work, but you wouldn't have the internal combustion and it would take a lot longer to decompose and possibly it wouldn't be as good a finished product. Not to say you can't make small piles. What we're doing here is building a microbial layer cake. We're trying to create a habitat, an environment, a pasture for our herd of microbes. And so we're alternating layers of carbon, layers of nitrogen. And in this instance, we're trying to have about three times as much nitrogen as carbon. So we've been building this pile and the next layer is going to be a carbon layer. And we're going to use an admixture of leaves and uh, chips. And I like both of these individually, but I like them both better in tandem. So I'm going to just simply, I'll just do a little portion of this. Spread a thin layer of leaves evenly. Around the whole pile. And I stress the evenness and in order to really do that at, a, at the opposite side, I'll have to actually walk around. I'm just doing a little sample of this Whoosh, over the whole pile about like that. Paying attention to the corners and edges and then I'm going to use this wood chips which is actually good in and of itself but good because it weights down the uh, uh, leaves a little bit so you don't have too much air space. And so I'll do like that. Let me walk over to the far side there. Okay, so boom, uh, about an inch layer. Uh, okay, folks, let's do it. And uh, actually, why don't we switch? Why don't you help with that? And then uh, one of the critical uh, ingredients in a compost pile is moisture. You will need to wet pretty much every layer as you go up and up and up. And depending on the material itself, it's moisture holding. Uh, how much moisture it has in it now and uh, uh, what time of year it is you may need to apply quite a bit of moisture as we will here summertime everything's pretty dry in the winter sometimes we apply little or no moisture 
Your moisture content of the pile should be at about 40 to 60 percent. That doesn't mean a lot to me. An analogy that kind of works for me is like a wet but wrung out towel or sponge. Every once in a while I'll just come and plunge my hand in and assess the moisture and say like, oh my goodness, we need to put more on it or nailed it or a little too much, back off. Uh, so these folks are going to walk over here and get this edge here and it's, uh, everything is, it's, it's about being tabletop flat and steep sided and even all the way around. Because what we're doing is we're making uh, layers here, thin and repetitive layers. But what would probably be best would be to take all this material and shred it and homogenize it and make a pile out of that. That proves to be cumbersome, physically impossible, etc. So this repetitive thin layers gets you there. But the idea is that what are all the needs you have in a compost pile about moisture, air, carbon nitrogen ratio, that those are met at every point in the pile. So that speaks to this even, repetitive, thin layers alternating carbon and nitrogen. Uh, we could use a little bit, not to be a backseat composter, but we could use a little more over here. And then I'm just going to begin to spray. And this will take a while to get this wet. So I would walk around this pile five or six times with a spray like this that penetrates this very dry carbon layer. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to do a little look-see here right now. And then I'm going to stop. But we need to get in here and do that. So maybe we can get a volunteer to do this right now. Thank you, thank you. So let's just, don't worry about too much. Okay. And just, you know, you, you're not like line driving it, but you're not like misting it. So, you know, about like that. And so it goes in and I just walk evenly around. Yeah. All right, water on. Water. We've completed the carbon layer here, maybe an inch or less, an admixture of wood chips and uh, deciduous leaves. And now I want to put on a nitrogen layer and I have a number of different materials here and I've chosen to get rid of cycle, recycle the gooey goppy kitchen scraps I have here. And uh, why don't I do that? Again, this is where you really need a thin layer. So obviously this is not a thin layer. I will spread it out in a minute. And I suspect I don't have an adequate amount of these kitchen scraps to make the complete approximately three inch layer I'm going for. So I will supplement with other nitrogen sources, principally lush greens and manure. What a thing. And since I'm the uh, individual who decided to dump this out, <laughs> I expect complete accountability. No fear and no pride. I'm going home to take a shower at lunch. If you have a luncheon date or you're going to attend a lecture after this, maybe not a good thing to do. This is such beautiful material, and I say that because of all the materials we have, it is the most nutrient laden because it essentially is uh, the complex of my diet at home, and because all of these materials are oh so much more laden with nitrogen than any of our other nitrogen sources. The issue is, yeah, it's a little gooey goppy, eh? Uh, and Never mind the old factory factor. It's just if you were to have too thick a layer of this, 
it would become anaerobic. So I'm just shooting for a thin layer. Somewhat even throughout. And like I said, I want about a three inch layer of this material here. And I won't get it by solely using the limited amount of kitchen scraps available to me right now. So I'm going to supplement volumetrically with manure and greens. And uh, God, this is a still life. Sort of. Okay, uh, and then I'm going to put a little more green material on top, and this is bigger in its particle size, and although it's plenty moisture laden, it's drier than that. Just kind of set it off a little bit, just a thin layer, uh, again, throughout. There are several things to consider here. One, as I said, you want alternate layers of green material, nitrogenous material, and carbonaceous material. For practical, simple purposes, you want about three times as much nitrogenous material as carbonaceous material. Greens favored over browns. Um, but the, another thing you can think about is the particle size of that what you're putting on. So if you have some really coarse stuff, you can put some fine stuff on top of it. You have all, you, can, you can mix it up in a variety of different ways like that. But basically you're alternating greens and browns. Um, and I want more. Always want more, uh, and in this case, need more for my nitrogen ratio. So I'm going to take manure. Again, this is a horse manure with bedding material, and uh, pile it on. It gets me my three inch layer, but it also weights down this more bulky green material. If we had a machete, we could chop it up a little bit to reduce particle size. So, uh, again, the reduction of particle size does a couple things here. One, it, it gets rid of the undue air pockets, so it's not too dry and it doesn't wick out. And again, reduction of particle size increases surface area, which makes more of an area that the microbes can get on and enzymatically decompose. I don't have to take this to the nth degree, I'm just chopping it a little bit. There are systems of composting, particularly home composting systems, that uh, where you make a small pile and you reduce particle size of everything to one to two inches, and you turn it every other day. And it's laborious, but a labor of love, no doubt. And you can actually produce a finished compost pile if you reduce particle size thusly and turn approximately every other day in about 30 to 40 days. A pile like this with mixed material in it will probably take three or four months. If we turn it, the process will be accelerated. If we don't, it won't. Okay, I'm almost done with my layer of greens, but I'm going to try to put a little more Manure on top here. When the pile was lower, we could just simply come and dump the manure. We're now getting up to a height where we might just shovel it. I'll do a section of this and then stop and then we can all jump in. So again, what is the purpose of this? Is to add more nitrogen and the purpose is also to uh, weight down the bulky green material, but also some of this finer particled 
manure will sift down into the lower layer and you have a nice admixture of a bunch of different nitrogen rich products. I'll stop now. But the aim here now is we jump in and do this and that we have someone wetting it as we go and we wet it good until it has the moisture of a wrung out sponge and then we have a nitrogen layer so this is the audience participation part of the class. We need more manure. Someone, uh, we can dump these chips here, we got a little bit here. Let's figure out how many people we have, how much stuff we need and convey it here so we can kind of just keep building, keep building, keep building. How many layers do we want? Uh, we want to go, I'd say we'd want another two or three layers of everything for starters. We'll see how time and materials uh, treat us. Let's get someone grabbing that hose and wetting, wetting, wetting as we go. And if we wet and wet and wet, we still won't be wet enough, so wet.